Thank you, Luke, for that introduction. Uh, very happy to be giving this talk today. Um, so let's have a discussion on the Firebird, or better known as the Northern Bobway, some of its ecology and restoration. So for today's talk, I'm going to give you all a brief history of tall timbers. Um, we'll dive into some of the quail uh, population trends, um, the life cycle, and, and important life stages of quail. Um, we'll talk about some management basics using some examples from within the region and how uh, the management of quail uh, can impact other species. So tall timbers lies within the Red Hills region of uh, North Florida, South Georgia, between uh, Thomasville and Tallahassee. In 1919, sportsman and naturalist Henry L. Beadle purchased the uh, purchased tall timbers to be used as a quail hunting plantation. He conducted prescribed burns uh, after every hunting season to remove overgrown vegetation and make it more appealing to uh, nesting birds. <clears throat> prescribed fire became an outlawed practice in the 1920s and immediately following the absence, uh, Beetle started noticing his quail hunting success start to decrease. And so he was confused by this decline in quail and really overall diversity. And so he and a group of other avid outdoorsmen and landowners um, brought in Herbert Stoddard, uh, an ecologist, uh, to figure out why. Um, ultimately, he found that the absence of fire diminished quail habitat, thus reducing quail populations and hunting opportunity. And so before Henry Beadle died in 1958, he donated the entire Tall Timbers estate to be used as an ecological research station that is not bound by university or government constraints. Um, and so today, uh, Tall Timbers Research Station is a nonprofit organization devoted to scientific and educational purposes, where our mission is to fo foster exemplary land stewardship through research, conservation, and education. Upon the donation of Tall Timbers, Herbert Stoddard uh, created the Stoddard Fire Ecology Plots, which are um, amongst the longest running fire frequency test plots in the Southeast. Uh, these consist of 84 half acre plots representing 29 different fire return intervals from one to 75 years and a plot right in the middle of tall timbers um, that has not seen fire since 1968. That could be a whole other presentation in itself. And then long term quail studies were reinitiated in 1968 with the primary focus on how management affected bobwhite populations through achieving a better understanding on long term population demographics. Which brings us to where we are today. Um, Tall Timbers has seven regional quail programs, ranging from um, the western piney woods of East Texas down to uh, South Central Florida, and most recently up here on the Delmarva Peninsula. And uh, as a matter of fact, Tall Timbers participated in the reintroduction of wild quail to southern Pennsylvania yesterday, um, where they were once extirpated. The quail are uh, referred to as a grassland species. Um, since 1999, um, their populations have decreased by at least 4% per year. Uh, however, um, in certain areas, declines have stalled in various states uh, due to um, uh, restoration efforts. But it's not just quail, um, it's grassland species um, completely. As you can see here, this uh, these stats come from stateofthebirds.org. State um, grassland birds are the second most declining uh, group of species in the country. And this is due to landscape level changes in land use. Um, basically just a, bu a bunch of exotic cool season pasture grasses, um, urbanization and urban sprawl creating uh, fragmented habitat and completely eliminating um, usable space. And then um, the conversion of woodlands to pine plantations and then uh, fire suppression, like we've uh, mentioned before. And then clean farming practices uh, where fields became larger uh, to make way for bigger equipment and center pivot irrigation systems, um, chemicals and commercial fertilizers Fertilizers reduce the need for crop rotations, 
and felled land, um, which was ultimately um, quail were the byproduct of that um, decades ago. We're getting into the life history of quail, uh, kind of where we're at today. Um, we're about to hit April, believe it or not. And this marks the start of the breeding season. So existing coveys are going to start breaking up and forming those um, mating pairs, um, initiating in um, egg laying, nest building, um, those sorts of things. Uh, generally speaking, there are several peaks in nesting throughout the breeding season. Um, the first usually occurs in the first part of June and is considered the most important. And this is because it is the greatest, it is what it is the time period where the uh, greatest number of nests are on the ground at one time. And the initial nests have the largest clutch or number of total eggs in the nest. As we move through the breeding season, um, we get into uh, brood rearing and then late nesting. Um, but brood rearing is one of those critical time periods in a quail's life cycle. Uh, quail, quail chicks can't fly and th thermoregulate until about uh, 14 days of age. So the first two weeks of their life is critical for their survival. Uh, we want to be able to build a diverse habitat so it creates a buffet of insects for the chicks, giving them the nutrients they need to jumpstart their growth. And then as we move on into the later parts of summer and early parts of fall, October begins that overwinter um, or non-breeding season. Um, coveys will start to begin to uh, pair up in the in October, and then it'll move through um, the uh, the winter time. Um, and this this time period is crucial. Um, you want to have su a sufficient habitat here to be able to get these birds through and carry over into the next breeding season. So the term grassland uh, is a little bit misleading. Um, that would be considered a monoculture of grasses. So quail rely on more than just grasses. Um, they rely on shrubs, scrubs, uh, hedges, what have you, um, and then also forbs and legumes. And so what we, what we call this is uh, the rule of thirds. So a third of the habitat should be in shrub, scrub. Um, this is used for a lot of that escape cover, that overwinter cover. Grasses are generally used for nesting. And then the forbs and legumes are used for brood rearing and foraging. So how do we get there? Um, well, we want sunlight to be able to hit the ground. Uh, so we open up uh, the tree canopy. Uh, we recommend tree spacing rather than a basal area uh, where the prescription for this is 65 feet canopy edge to canopy edge in a pine stand. Um, in a mixed hardwood pine savanna setting, if that's the objective, uh, we recommend greater spacing from hardwoods and, and suggest that total hardwood canopy coverage does not exceed 10%. Uh, we want to be able to favor the pines so that fire uh, can carry through the understory. So this picture on the left, uh, that is uh, a pine thinning from Kent County, Delaware on some public land. And then on the right, uh, this is a hardwood pine uh, savanna in Wicomico County, Maryland. And then to manage the vegetation and exposed bare ground, uh, we use a combination of tools such as herbicide and prescribed fire. Uh, we want to eliminate the invasive and undesirable species, um, such as but not limited to um, those invasive cool season grasses, uh, as Luke mentioned, um, calorie pear trees um, and sweet gums as well. Some common practices for removing grasses and encouraging forbs are applications of uh, glyphosate, clethodome or plateau, uh, while some prescriptions for Removing encroaching woodies uh, include um, some applications of triclopyr. Um, in overgrown hedgerows, felling trees and treating stumps um, with certain herbicides um, is an effective tool as well. But be sure to follow all label uh, recommendations and restrictions. And then we can achieve the rule of thirds um, through consistent use of prescribed fire on a two year rotation. And so, what this means is just imagine like a checkerboard. So say this year, you might be burning um, those white squares and then next year burning those black squares and then maintaining consistency in that by repeating it. 
burning at least 50% of manageable land across property every year will help keep things in check and maximize the usability um, across your property. So when it comes to managing the ground cover, I can't stress enough the importance of having enough shrubs across your property. Um, having the right amount will help quail through significant snowfall events during the overwinter sprout period like we saw this past winter. Um, and it provides enough bare ground for them to forage and stay warm while roosting. Looking at this photo here, we have a bunch of shrubs um, that are basically holding up grasses. You can't see it, but underneath there was all bare ground. This one here, even though it's not bare ground necessarily, um, a dusting of snow is a lot better than layers of ice and three inches of snow. Um, we got some rabbit turds right here. And so it's not just quail uh, seeking out this, this shelter here. And lastly, these are some wider uh, cedar trees. Again, you can't see it, but the grasses and um, the cedar trees have created a lot of bare ground underneath them. Another important component to ground cover is having adequate brood range. Really, this is just having enough bare ground and overhead structure while creating a buffet of insects um, and forage availability. Uh, we recommend that 20% of all manageable habitat is adequate brooding cover. You can achieve this by annually disking uh, designated fields or patches uh, right around February or early March. And this stimulates the growth of forbs and legumes like ragweed and partridge pea. Um, not to mention annual rotational disking can be a good alternative to prescribed fire. But please keep in mind that prescribed fire is really the only naturally occurring management tool that we use. One thing to consider uh, with brood cover and maximizing chick survival is how the brood range is organized on your property. Um, a quail chick, when it first hatches, is about the size of your thumb, uh, really tiny. So having everything a chick needs to survive in the general vicinity of where it hatched is essential. Uh, so having brood range that is surrounded by different bird burn regimes maximizes those available resources. So a couple examples of this is here on the left. This is down in Dorchester County. Um, there's an existing planting of some sawtooth oaks on this um, eastern, southeastern side of this plot here. And then um, this landowner is gonna go through, plant some partridge pea right down the middle, and then plant the native grasses and some hopefully some shrubs on this um, western, northwestern side. And so every year, essentially, the middle is gonna be annually disked um, for that brood range. Then the white will be burned one year, and then the black will be burned the next year, um, and just flip-flopping um, with that. This example on the right, this was over 20 acres of just big blue stem. And so we took 20% of that use that space in the middle converted it to uh, brood range. This again will be annually disked. Um, actually, this past week we burned um, this western northwestern side here, and then next year, ideally, uh, this eastern southeastern portion will be burned. <clears throat> So some of you may be wondering um, if ag fields would be adequate brood range or what the difference may be. Um, a colleague's master's thesis did a comparison and the difference is that fallowed fields or those uh, sections that are being annually disked for brood range produce more insect biomass earlier in the season. You can see that here on June 24th. That's probably um, right around peak hatch. Uh, for those initial nesting attempts. And so fallow fields almost produce double the amount of biomass early on in the season. And so essentially this is just, like I said, more nutritional availability for those first broods to gather enough for rapid growth development. Um, in addition to this, ag fields are generally um, covering larger amounts of acres and broods may not be, or may only be using those edges. And so optimal brood field size is less than 
five acres. Anything larger than that is just a uh, diminishing effort. And so um, the entirety of that field might be using, might be uh, used. Again, it's all about maximizing usable space. So one, one of the end goals with restoration uh, should be to provide a quail with year round opportunity to walk from one corner of your property to the opposite corner without ever being exposed to predators. And so implementing field borders and habitat strips are good ways to do exactly that. Um, taking whole fields out of production would be ideal, but most of the times that's not an option. Um, so converting just 20% of the field of production can be beneficial. Um, fewer but wider strips rather than more narrow strips decrease um, the hunting efficiency of a predator. And we recommend that these strips are at least 90, 90 foot wide, but again, the wider the better, the more habitat, the merrier. Um, gather your neighbors in on this. Um, this is a good way to expand connectivity um, and start hitting it from a, a landscape scale. And then combining supplemental management tools can really push things over the edge in a positive way. And we'll get into more of this um, in a few minutes. So an example of some of these habitat strips, this is Queen Anne's County, Maryland. Um, these are just about 90 foot buffers around this entire field uh, with um, buffers going right through the middle. I actually did a, a covey count here this past fall and I identified actually three coveys using this one right about here, and then one on either side of this Western strip here. This is an example from Kent County, Maryland, um, much wider buffer strips through here. And one unique thing about this uh, property here is these are waterfall impoundments. And uh, the property owner noticed that once they started incorporating and enhancing the habitat around their waterfall impoundments, it increased their waterfowl hunting. Waterfowl just seems to uh, feel more concealed coming into those impoundments. This is Newcastle County, Delaware. Um, these fields are actually rotated for dove hunting. But again, there is plenty of habitat all around with a lot of um, that scrub shrub cover on the northern end, um, right through the middle, and then on the southern end. So one of those additional management tools is uh, nest predator reduction. Um, before you engage in this, um, consult with uh, your state and federal laws and regulations. Um, if necessary, if necessary um, obtain the, nest, the permits and licenses you need. Um, and then once you start getting into it, um, should be done at appropriate level intensity and timing. Obviously in Maryland and Delaware, we can't trap, I think it's past March 15th or something like that. Um, but trapping up to that point and as close to the breeding season uh, as possible will have beneficial effects. Um, trapping is also a, a good additional recreational opportunity as it occurs during the time period between the end of deer waterfall season between turkey season. So if you need to get your fix in, this is a good good way to do so. And it's benefiting um, numerous different species. It's also a good way to introduce um, younger generations to the outdoors. So a lot of times when I bring up predator trapping, people wanna see numbers. Um, so this is Palmer et al, a, a study written in 2010. Um, they used an agricultural setting in North Carolina where they had three treatments. Um, the first was predator reduction. Um, the second was enhancing field borders or implementing field borders. And then the third treatment was combining them. And so if you see here, um, neither of those treatments, this is just basically the control. There were simply existing populations of quail. Then when you started to incorporate field borders, um, you started to see those fall densities rise quite a bit. But it wasn't really until you start to uh, implement those field borders and reduce uh, the predator population where numbers really started um, 
to become significant. If you see here in the last uh, year of the study, um, numbers almost actually doubled from the control. So another study, Jackson et al. in 2018, um, did a study on partial uh, mesomammal um, predator removal on a reproductive success of quail. These four figures um, on the left of each of them was basically no trapping and then um, head trapping. Um, really what this is, is this one represents nest success, um, predicted number of nests per 100 hens, predicted number of broods per 100 hens, and then predicted number of chicks per 100 hens. And then as you can see, um, trends uh, are basically positive in favor of trapping. And so what that looks like with numbers, um, nests were 1.3 times more successful. Um, and this was basically 56% versus 48%. Uh, um, and then per capita, um, there were 14 more nests produced, this predicted number of nests produced. Um, per capita, 12 more broods produced and 109 more chicks produced. And uh, you know, this is just a lot more quail on the landscape. Another one of those additional management tools is supplemental feeding. Um, again, you want to consult with state and federal laws and regulations on this, um, but there are kind of two main ways to go about supplemental feeding. That's broadcast feeding and stationary feeding. However, we recommend broadcast feeding um, rather than stationary feeding because that stationary feeding, that's basically like a gravity feeder um, in, a, uh, in one stationary location. And so unless those, those feeders are not uh, moved often, predators can keen in on those locations. Whereas broadcast feeding, um, you're using like a fertilizer spreader or a seed spreader on the back of a tractor, ATV, um, whatever you have access to, and you're broadcasting this seed, um, usually sorghum or milo, into existing habitat. And so not only are, uh, are quail concealed and in the cover, but they also have um, availability of, of food right there. And so you broadcast feed on um, by establishing feed lines. And so what these are basically, the, it's, it's um, established lanes through existing habitat. And our recommendation there is 1.7 miles of feed line for 100 acres of manageable habitat, feeding one to two bushels of milo per acre per year. Um, and studies have shown that quail actually don't consume a majority of supplemental feed, rather it's the songbirds and small mammals that do. Um, but nonetheless, supplemental feed provides energy and nutrition at times when nutritional demands are at their highest, like during the overwinter period and right before nesting. So once we start restoring some of the habitat, we can get into um, monitoring, seeing how um, the quail respond. Uh, we do this by conducting summer whistling male counts, uh, that uh, famous Bob White sound. Um, these summer whistle counts are a tool uh, we use to identify where quail are, or really where they aren't too, and how populations respond to the management on any given property. Uh, they can also be a useful index to predict fall covey numbers and to monitor periods of peak nesting. Then the fall covey counts um, can provide a good index for how successful the breeding season was, and provide a good estimate on fall densities. So how does bobwhite management um, impact other species? Uh, Crosby et al, and I uh, encourage y'all to uh, look this paper up and, and read it, it's a really good one. Um, they suggested that bob whites, a game species, can act as an umbrella species for other species of greatest conservation need. Um, and a lot of the those species listed in this paper were are listed on the Maryland and Delaware state action plans. Um, management of bob white also enhances cover and foraging for deer and turkey. Um, 
Quail and turkey management really go hand in hand. If you ask any of the turkey experts out there, they'll probably mention that adequate brooding cover is a limiting factor for turkeys. So brooding cover for quail is also brooding cover for turkeys. Um, you know, orchids are a rare species of plants and they're responding after, fi after fire has been reintroduced on some lands here in Maryland um, that have been absent for an extended period of time. It boosts pollinator diversity and activity um, through encouraging native uh, vegetation growth. Um, and then it enhances ecosystem resilience. Uh, fire can help reduce fuel buildup. It may cause wildfires um, and build resilience against disease and insect outbreaks. Uh, it can also reduce your exposure to ticks and tick-borne diseases. So some key points uh, that I want to leave y'all with um, is that habitat tr trumps all. Um, you know, if there's not habitat, you, you won't have quail. Um, there's no such thing as a little bit of quail management. And so, you know, half acre of, of grasses or habitat here, three acres there. Um, it all needs to be connected. And just like I said uh, in, um, earlier on, the more habitat, the merrier. Um, and so I'm not sure if y'all have ever heard of uh, Liebig's law of the minimum, um, but this basically states that growth is dictated not by total resources available, but rather the limiting factor. And so if you look at this barrel here, um, a landowner's goals or objectives um, might be this the the yield in this in this barrel, um, whether that be one quail per two acres, um, being able to hunt two to three times a year, what have you. And so each of these planks would represent um, some of those variables that we're talking about. So spoiler alert, you know, 90% of the time um, in this landscape, fescue is going to be the most limiting factor. So let's imagine that fescue is a limiting factor here. We have uh, pine thinning, um, hardwood reduction, and then maybe some predator management. Your limiting factor is going to inhibit you from achieving those objectives. So keep in mind that habitat is always two to three years away from being lost. And really that, that two to that two year fire return interval is going to mitigate some of that. And then quail act as umbrella species. Maybe you're not necessarily um, wanting to bring quail back, but um, the management of quail is going to help conserve uh, and restore um, populations of other species. Some resources, the titles of the papers I mentioned here are, uh, I have listed here. Um, you know, feel free to join the Tall Timbers mailing list uh, using this website here. Um, be on the lookout for prescribed fire uh, trainings and workshops. We have one coming up on April 1st and 2nd here in uh, Kent County. And then consult with your local NRCS um, representatives, Quell Forever. Natural Lands Project, Laura Shore Land Trust, not limited to just these resources, but these guys are going to um, provide you with the cost share opportunity uh, to be able to implement a lot of this habitat. I wanna give a special thanks to Luke. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Um, this has been fun. Um, and then the Maryland and Delaware DNR, Delaware Department of Ag, Working Lands for Wildlife and Tall Timbers for funding. Um, uh, first few years of this project, and then the partnerships that have been created through the first stages. If you want to reach me? This is my contact information here. Feel free to call me at any time. Um, talk hunting, habitat, quail, uh, anything you'd like. And that'll take any questions. Awesome, Kyle. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. I really appreciate it. Um, popping a few of those papers in the chat for anybody who wants to have access to those scientific uh, findings and look a little bit deeper into them. Um, we've got a few questions in already. Everybody who's on, please do feel free to throw a few more in here. We've got a nice amount of time for questions. Oftentimes we run out of time for questions, so it's really great. We have some some good time for this. Um, so uh, Karen Anderson asked, and I can answer this too, but I'll let you do it, uh, Kyle. Uh, 
are captive bred quail still being released in some places? And uh, yeah, maybe elaborate on some of that that topic. Yeah, captive quail are being um, released in some places. Um, that's kind of just up to the landowner's objectives on things. Um, captive quail um, do provide good opportunity if um, you have an intensive hunting objective. But however, um, releasing captive quail, it does uh, negatively influence the vigilance and behavior and maybe even some reproduction of wild quail. Um, captive quail also, it can um, predators can keen in on them, especially if there are larger amounts of them being released. Um, and so if that's something you're considering, I would sway you away from that, but um, you know, that's all based on your objectives. Okay. Um, I think technically in Maryland, I think there, I think there is a requirement if you're going to release them. I think too, there is a, on the books, a law that I think you need to get a permit to do so, I believe. Um, so yeah, but that helps answer that. So I'll mark that as live. Karen, if there's any follow-up questions you have on that, feel free to pop, pop them in the chat. Um, uh, Ed McWilliams, who's with Quail Forever out in Delaware, uh, he has some, back on those charts where you had the red and the blue lines between the fallow fields and the insect abundance, um, what the difference was between the different colors. Yeah, there you go. Y'all see that all right? Yeah. I think the difference there um, was just uh, predicted biomass. That's just some statistical things going on there. Um, but this article uh, or the these these graphs and figures do come from um, the 2023 quail call, and you can find that on um, the Tall Timbers website and read through that article, and it'll give you more information than, than what I just gave you. Cool, cool, um, great. Uh, Ed, okay, so that's done. Uh, Jen, Jenny, I think that's Jenny Rosencrantz. Thanks for joining. She asked about um, whether you use both herbicide and burning used together, or is it one or the other? Um, when you're starting to restore habitat, um, we recommend using both. Um, you know, you want to get the uh, that right ratio of um, vegetation in there, like I said, the rule of thirds. Um, but the more you apply this on a consistent basis, the more efficient it gets. And so you, it might be a situation where you get your timing of fire down and you can just manage it with fire at that point. Great. Right. And this is something I had a, maybe a little bit of a follow-up or a little bit of elaboration for people who might be thinking about herbicide use. You mentioned three herbicides, glyphosate, plateau, and clethodum. And maybe you could elaborate a little bit on the unique aspects, like for timing of Roundup, uh, the sort of selective nature of clethodum and, and plateau, in case anybody would like to dig into that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so glyphosate, that's a um, not necessarily a selective herbicide. It targets everything. Um, and so uh, timing of the application of glyphosate could be right after um, right after uh, forbs, legumes, and all that has gone dormant for the season. So applying that in maybe late October, uh, November, um, to really eradicate a lot of that, the fescue, um, that'd probably be your primary goal. You always want to try to to target the hardest um, species to control. Um, whereas clethodum and plateau, the active ingredient in plateau is a mazepec. Um, those can be more grass selective herbicide. Um, and so say you do have like a stand of big blue stem that has gotten too thick because it can get too thick. If well aren't using it, um, spraying some uh, herbicide on that, you know, some strips um, can encourage the growth of forbs. And then I think I mentioned trichopyr too. Trichopyr um, will target some of the hardwood species um, and uh, Make some forbs as well. Um, so if you have like stand sweet gum or something like that, the uh, trichopyr can can help control those. And the brand name for that is that Garlon often the brand name that we find for trichopyr. 
Mm. I believe. Yes, I believe so. Garland 3A. Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's a three and there's a four. One is for foliage application. The other is you can use on the, a bark, a basal bark treatment where you can spray around the base of the, of the, uh, of the tree or a young sapling and it will kill it just from spraying over the top of the bark all the way around the tree. Yeah. I reckon I uh, mentioned um, the stump uh, treatment too, when you're felling trees to reclaim some overgrown hedgerows. Um, I personally have good success with using the Craig Harper cocktail that is triclopyr water and um, arsenal. Um, so right. nice hot um, mixture there. Try and I'll try and look up that recipe up online. I'm sure it's on there. Craig Harper uh, is a University of Tennessee Extension agent and just won the uh, Distinguished Career Service Award at the Southeast Deer Study Group. So uh, he's just an icon in this field. So definitely would uh, follow his recommendations on stuff. Um, I'd, I'd ask again, where is your office? Where are you located, Kyle? And where do you work? You work across the Delmarva, right? Yes, I'm located out of Kent County, Maryland. Um, and, but I cover the whole Eastern shore, Delaware, and then, um, down into that portion of Virginia. Great. Uh, Barry Waterman asked, he said he has 50 acres of CRP. He had three coveys back in 2012. It got wiped out by snow and he hasn't seen a quail since. Uh, he mentions he traps predators, burn and discs on rotation. He's asking his continued management going to eventually get quail back. Or do they need to be reintroduced? And this is something I'm thinking a lot about myself. Um, <clears throat> yeah, 50 acres. Um, you can do a lot with that. But um, if you have if you have good relationships with your neighbors, um, you know, I keep hitting home. The more, the merrier. Um, and so, oftentimes, it can be one of those cases. You continue to enhance that habitat. You continue to build that habitat. Um, you may be surprised quail can't find it. I think um, we're in a pretty unique landscape here. And um, when all the crops are are growing during the summer, um, everything is essentially connected. Uh, and so um, you'd be surprised if, if quail can find it or not. Yeah. And I think something also that's important to answer this, Barry, is uh, the question we got from Eric, which I'll just ask right now, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, how far do you think birds can move on the landscape from a source population in a year, given given it has suitable habitat to establish in areas that haven't had birds? Um, I can't answer that with, with exact numbers, but I will point you in the direction of a good presentation given by Dr. James Martin at um, the Quail Symposium that Luke put on with uh, uh, Quail Forever. Um, I think it was uh, this past August. Yeah, um, he did a wonderful presentation on that. I'm looking it up right now, and I will share that in the link right here. I think this is it. I found it. Here we go. Share. Great. Um, yeah, I think you know a lot of people use some back of the envelope numbers. Like um, I'm gonna type this in here for that to answer that question. I'm gonna put it in the chat for everybody. Yeah. Um, James Martin did a great job addressing sort of the, the nuances of that question. A lot of people will use like a six mile distance for dispersal, but it's, it's very, it's very dependent on a lot of factors. So, um, but yeah, Barry, it's a tough thing. A lot of places that are 50 miles from quail, it's going to be really tough without reintroduction. And I'll say that uh, I'm working with some partners in the Point Pleasant Foundation to try to establish an area from which we can get high density wild quail populations on the landscape using in partnership with tall timbers and their management um, techniques and their experience with this. So we can try to have a more local uh, wild population from which we could start to reintroduce birds around Maryland, especially the Western shore and places of the Eastern shore that are, that are 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away from quail. So, um, but yeah, we're, you're, it's an exciting thing. It's I'm I'm working on it, and uh, there's nothing more I'd rather be doing than that. So keep uh keep keep following us for more on that. So uh, someone asked, uh, what are some good case studies for woody invasive control and power line corridors? And I'm gonna preface this by saying I know I saw Richard Johnstone jump through into this uh, on our call. Let me see if he's still on. 
but he does a lot of this himself. Um, uh, but yeah, if you want to add any, if you have any thoughts or a knowledge of uh, invasive control on power line corridors, uh, Kyle. Yeah, I guess it would kind of depend on um, what the invasive is. Um, some are bigger beasts than others. Um, so you just kind of kind of find what what works for you. Um, you know, across the region, um, I work with several managers that um, what might work for them might not work for the other. Um, so it all just depends on on what the invasive is. Um, like I said, the if it's uh, fescue, um, glyphosate, or those grass selective herbicides. Um, for uh, those woody, um, for the woody encroachment, um, triclopyr, um, maybe even some um, those foliar applications and glyphosate can take care of that. You can also use the seasonal timing of fire to help with, with that. Um, if you burn later on in the season, um, you're going to encourage a little bit more forb growth and, um, you know, uh, uh, inhibit some of the um, woody stem encroachment. Um, but then if you burn, you know, into the, the dormant season, you're going to encourage grasses. So, Great. I'm popping uh, Richard's uh, contact on the chat as well. I know he's given talks on this topic and I've talked to him several times about that issue. And he's done, you know, I think power lines are probably one of the best connectivity tools we have to on the landscape to get um, get that dispersal to happen. So I think improving our management of our power lines is a great tool. And I know BGD is doing good work on that in Calvert County. I think some are still mowed, which is really just not a great way to get Bob White's uh, back on the landscape because oftentimes mowing happens during the nesting season and they're nesting in the grasses at that time and they get mowed over and uh, those nests become uh and get destroyed. Uh, yeah, so, if you have the deed to that uh, right away, um, I do believe there's there's some cost share for that. Yeah, a lot of times people, the landowners underneath the right of way, yeah, have the have the rights to manage it under certain recommend under some basic guidelines. So yeah, I think they can also have an influence in what happens with the management of those. So instead of getting them mowed annually, if they're getting mowed and you own some, you can I believe depending on your got your deed, you can possibly work with the the power line company to improve the management and that would be all the tools kyle was describing disking fire might be difficult under under a power line so i think we're looking at disking and herbicides your main tools to main, manage that as a more quail friendly habitat and ideally also thinning those forests around the the power lines um okay uh karen asked uh what are the earliest dates for nests in Calvert County, in one of our county parks, we had a report of a possible nest with eggs yesterday. Oh, my gosh, I'm so excited. I live in Calvert County. Karen, we've got to be in touch. Eggs appear to be quail eggs. Other possible ground nesting birds have been eliminated. This seems to be very early, but given the mild winter, may it be possible? It is early. Yeah, I guess anything's possible. Um, but it, it it is quite a bit early still, especially for these northern latitudes. Um and if there are those early nesters, I, I think the earliest I've seen down in um, Tallahassee, Florida, was right around like April 25th. Um, so right around that time period. Um, so it could be a little early for that. Yeah. Um, the majority of nests will be around that first one or two weeks of June. Um, I'll take a brief moment to mention, I know there's a lot of interest, Karen, um, on getting... Uh, a Patuxent River corridor established. Uh, my colleague, um, Eddie Beck, who might be in on this call right now, is looking at leading some efforts around that. So anything in Calvert County in the Patuxent River area for quail, we are definitely interested in, in hearing more about it and, and uh, working with you and helping provide any resources we can. So I'm going to try and find you and maybe I'll send you an email. Feel free to send me an email. We can learn more about that. Um, Jenny asked, uh, how are quail affected by drought? It would depend on the timing of it. Um, so if there's like drought early on in the um, breeding season, 
Um, it could delay it a little bit because um, obviously water is going to influence the growth of vegetation, which is going to influence um, the diversity of insects. Um, but however, if there's a drought um, or extended period of um, little to no rainfall, um, while uh, chicks are brooding, um, it can actually in encourage their growth. Um, so it's all about really season, uh, um, timely rainfalls, um, more so than you know, drought, if that's going to influence them or not. Great. I'm noticing in the chat a few little comments uh, on, yeah, Angela Yao mentioned she loves seeing quail rebound and after prescribed burning was reintroduced at Gainesville Nature Parks in Florida. Uh, I don't know if that's somewhere you're familiar with from your work down there, down south, Kyle, but nice comments to see there. Um, great. Well, we're through all of our questions. I had one, I guess, one final question, and it does have to do with this timing, um, timing and such. So I know a lot of our timing for when we will be listening for calls and, and bird surveys it happens, I believe the standard time is June 1st to July 15th. Are they, are the nests already hatching? I think your, your, uh, calendar, I don't know if you want to show us that calendar with our calls. I was curious, are they calling when those nests are hatching? Is that kind of the peak calling time that we see on there? And uh, could you elaborate on that? Kind of what's happening with quail? Yeah, during that early hatch, because I'm noticing it seems like it's right in that, that June, July uh, calling period. Are they already hatching or are they also still pairing up or creating new nests as well? Um, I can't really speak on the timing of that. Um, I think that's a general um, rule of thumb for all um, breeding bird surveys. Um, but in terms of um, whistling quail and identifying the peaks in nesting there, um, it's one of those things when um, there's a majority of the hens sitting on nests, um, it's all about availability. And so that male bird is going to be whistling, trying to search for um, the next hen. Um, and so it's kind of like turkeys. Um, you know, you might see um, influxes in gobbling activity. It's because a lot of those um, hens are sitting on nests. And so they're just searching for the next one. Gotcha. Desperately trying to find their partner that the mm -hmm. last at the dance, right? Everybody's paired up and they're looking for another partner before everybody sits down, right? Um, Absolutely. Cool. Um, well, I will mention also take a chance to say uh, we've had some good news. We've been working, I presented this on this in the past. I may have mentioned it on this webinar, but we, I've been working with students for a couple of years to try to improve our uh, acoustic monitoring tools to monitor for Bob Whites at a broader scale. And so we have these devices um, I don't have one in front of me, but we have these small little devices called audio moths that we've been deploying over the last couple of years. And we've had some really good news in the last, in the last few, few weeks, we've sounds like we finally got some really good success for our fall covey calls. So we can record and get 90, we're in the 95% accuracy range for, for being able to use recorders and then plug that recording into a computer algorithm. And it will tell us how many calls we're getting. So really excited on being able to expand um, our monitoring efforts and find out where we have quail left because there's still a lot of questions as far as where exactly they are. Um, are they extirpated from the Western shore? You know, are they still around in, in Calvert? We hear scattered reports, but sometimes we wonder, oh, are those maybe captive birds and things like that? So I think this is going to be a, a great tool and we are uh, partnering with uh, some folks over at University of Pittsburgh for that. So uh, keep in touch on that. If you have places you think there might be quail and you'd like to maybe get some monitors out, we've got some extra monitors we can try in some places um, and try and confirm populations or, or see if they're there or not. So um, any other, I'll give us a final moment. Any last questions, drop them in the chat. If not, um, I want to say thanks, Kyle, for uh, for joining us and for sharing. Kyle's going to be around here. You're, you're going to hear from him. You're going to hear his name in the prescribed fire world. I know he's been out there getting busy meeting people. Um, and uh, it's going to be a great uh, compliment to helping to bring quail back on the landscape. So thanks for your work on that. And thanks for sharing your expertise. Thank you, Luke. 
I really appreciate it. And yeah. thank you to everybody that attended this afternoon. All right, everybody. Well, hopefully we'll see you next week, next month. Uh, we're going to hear about blue catfish, change over to aquatic wildlife, and how we can help to manage this invasive species and, and get it, and hopefully, our populous populations down in some of our, our waterways of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, thank you all so much, and we will see you all next month. Take care. All right. Go ahead and end this for everybody.